Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> Well, Elk Hunters, thanks for uh, tuning in to episode eight of the Elk Talk podcast. I'm Randy Newberg. And I'm Corey Jacobson. And we are in the middle of elk season. Corey, you, you've you been traveling way more than I have. I don't know you about have, that. You must have some really good stories that you're going to tell the audience between now and next elk season. Yeah, we've got some really good stories to tell. <laughs> Cool. I've been watching them on Instagram. What's your Instagram handle so people can go watch them if they're not? Uh, I, th I think it's just CoreyJacobson.Elk101. You think? You say that with so much conviction. Oh, well, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's like your own phone number when you have to give that out. It's like, I don't know. I never dial it. Yeah. Well, we better tell the world that this Elk Talk podcast is brought to them Thanks to the great folks at the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Absolutely. They are ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Um, who else makes this possible? We got Sitka Gear, right? Yeah, Sitka Gear. I've been uh, putting them to the test this season for sure, including some of their new gear. Yeah, I, I've been using the Apex stuff, the new synthetic the my favorite part of that is there's that synthetic merino blend shirt yeah or whatever you call it man i i got really let me put it this way other people in new mexico got a lot stinkier than i did over the last 12 days <laughs> see and i'm not a i'm not a huge merino fan uh -huh. for me you know I, I use the synthetic base layer but our camera guy was freaking out. He used to wear a different camo and he wanted to match us. And so he, he ordered some Sitka and he was really concerned because he's a huge Merino guy. And so he ordered a Merino zip tee and then he ordered the Apex hoodie, which is the blend synthetic and Merino. Yeah. And he was super impressed with the Apex hoodie and kind of the same thing. He said, I stink so bad after two days, I can't stand to be around myself. And he wore that Apex hoodie pretty much every day for eight days. And we did 94 miles on foot in eight days. And uh, he got done and he said, this is impressive. Yeah. Well, uh, for me, I, I had a guest hunter and he'd never used Merino. And uh, he thought it was, in fact, I think he stole the, the version I, or the set I brought for him. <laughs> I don't think it ended up back in my truck. <laughs> but, and then we got Gerber Gear, who uh, makes this possible. Uh, if you get a chance, go out to Instagram, follow them. Uh, it's at Gerber Gear is where they're at on Instagram. But uh, I've been using the Vital and Big Game Vital. Uh, the replaceable blade knives now since they came out with them. And uh, you know I kind of skipped the elk hunting thing and I went to Alaska, right, and did a sheep hunt and a Sitka blacktail hunt. Uh, got to use the, the Gerber products there. Uh, and uh, then 
it seems like every trip we go on, we break something. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm not saying it's because of the equipment, it's because of the abuse. And, you know, you fall on something or you drop it off a rock. Or, and so I always carry my Gerber center drive multi-tool. And it has uh, the little uh, hex screws that are perfect because there's three of them that fit my bow and all my accessories on my bow. So I've got all of those in there. And uh, I, I'm embarrassed to tell people how dependent I become on my center drive. But I, I think that So does that be have be, uh, like a, an Allen head adapter then to fit? Yep. Yeah, it's wow. got... It's got a whole string of uh, of different heads you can put in there, bits. Uh, and it's got the normal knife, the pliers, all that kind of stuff. So it works pretty Very good. Very cool. But, yeah. And then, uh, you know, you were going to supposedly send me some of your, uh, your line of calls. That, don't you have your own, like, Corey Jacobson is the rock star line of calls out at Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls? <laughs> There or am is, I going to have to buy those? There is an Elk 101 Signature Series line of calls, but nothing with my name personally on them. So now we do have uh, two diaphragm calls that are Elk 101 Signature Series. There's the All-Star Diaphragm and the Contender Diaphragm. There's the Elk 101 Temptress, which is an open reed cow call. And then the Elk 101 uh, Extreme, Bully Bull Extreme bugle tube that we use, all manufactured by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And uh, basically, we just helped in the design of them, kind of got the calls to our specs and uh, put our Elk 101 brand name on those calls. And we have a, a new diaphragm that's going to be coming out in spring of 2019 that We've been uh, kind of putting through the ringers this elk season and having some some really good success with it. Cool. So if people go to Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls and they use promo code Elk Talk, will they get fifteen percent off those uh, Elk One Hundred One calls? They will on any call, anything they order from uh, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls uh, through their website. If they use the promo code Elk Talk, they're going to save fifteen percent. Cool. Well, gosh, people are making money by listening to our podcast. <laughs> the other one our, we got our is poor sponsors. I, I think our poor sponsors their, are losing money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> GoHunt.com is still running their 30-day free trial. I don't know how much longer they're going to keep doing it, but if you want to have the best information at your fingertips, all the research that uh, a lot of us use for finding units, drawing tags, draw odds, application strategies, you name it. You want to have that Go Hunt Insider at your fingertips. And right now, if you to go, go to GoHunt.com forward slash Elk Talk, you can sign up for the 30-day free trial. You get everything. None of this, oh, tease you a little bit here or there. The whole works is available for 30 days free. Free is good, right? It's really good. Yeah, and if you can't get a feel for how much value there is in that in 30 days, uh, 30 days is enough time to get lost and and make plans for the next two elk seasons. It's it's incredibly valuable and powerful, and I can't, can't even explain how many people have emailed in the last 30 days and said, thanks so much for providing that code. I jumped in, took advantage of the 30-day free trial, this is amazing. I did have one person email and say, well, I had to put my credit card in and I don't feel comfortable doing that. And just know you can cancel any time, but during that 30 days, you don't get charged and go take advantage of it. Just take a peek in there, see what it's all about. If you don't like it, if it's not for you, you can cancel anytime. Yeah. Gohunt.com forward slash elk talk. For, for, for people where I grew up, you'd have to spell out talk, but I don't think our audience, our audience is way out in front of that. But. <laughs> just, just the common spelling, just kind of like it sounds, just elk talk. Yeah, pretty, yeah. And then the last one, you're, uh, you've probably been using this, some of the places you've been traveling is the Onyx 
system? I, I can't even, yeah, this has been the most powerful resource for us this elk season, just because we're going to brand new places and we've never been to some of these places at all physically before. And we're able to download the, uh, the you know, we're doing the 10 mile resolution. Uh, so because we're literally covering 30 or 40 miles and we're able to download that and it's been, for me, I, I don't even carry my GPS anymore. We just use the tracks on that. We track where we've been uh, for tracking elk. We've had a couple of tough track jobs and we've been able to see uh-huh. exactly where we've gridded, where we've had last blood, be able to you know connect the dots of all the blood to see the line the elk's traveling in. Uh, yeah, just so many powerful resources within the Onyx app on uh, just on our smartphone. It's been pretty awesome. Yeah, I just got, and we'll get into where we've been and where we're going, but I just got back from New Mexico in a unit I've never hunted before. And there's a lot more private land in that unit than most places I hunt in New Mexico. And the old saying of don't leave home without it surely applied there. And for people who, ah, if anyone's listening and doesn't have it yet, uh, I, I, I'm surprised if they don't. But if you don't, go to onxmaps.com and use promo code ELKTALK and get yourself 20% off that app. Yep. How easy is that? It's easy. Yeah. And that's a pretty substantial savings. Yeah. So with all that out of the way, Corey, this is like a mid-season catch-up. What are, what's today's date? September 18th. And you and I have been going different directions and will be going different directions for the, at least the next few months or a couple months, because we're in the middle of elk season. And I'm just sitting here looking at the calendar saying it's September 18th. What am I doing sitting here recording a podcast? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's a good question. Part of the reason I am is uh, I've been gone so much that I have to have a day or two back to the real world or my business and my marriage might collapse. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, No, it's good. I actually have been looking forward to being home and and having this time because it's, it's taxing. We've hunted, uh, I think 15 days so far with uh, about a four day break in between there. Yeah. And absolutely I'm living the dream. I, I don't deny that, but it's uh, it's not all glamorous, and it takes its toll on the body and on the mind, and it's good to have a couple of days of downtime to recharge. Uh, for sure. I, I left for Alaska for Sitka Blacktail and Doll Sheep on July 30th. I got back to Bozeman uh, August 26th. And was here for four or five days and then headed to New Mexico. And I just got back two days ago. And then I'm off to Colorado in two days from there to Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you're right. We are blessed to live the lives we do. But I've already lost 12 pounds. I don't know if that's a function of how fat I was before season started or how many miles I've hiked. But wow. either, either way, I'm down to my fighting weight. Yep. But. I don't keep track of weight, but I definitely know that I couldn't eat enough calories on our last hunt in Wyoming. And uh, I'm definitely glad to be home eating some home-cooked meals for a couple of days and recharging nutrient bases that were definitely depleted yeah when i got home my wife said what do you want for dinner i said i don't care just (laughs) whatever you cook i'm sure i'm going to eat the entire thing (laughs) Uh, dehydrated meals i don't think the human body was built to subsist specifically on dehydrated food you know i agree but i i have stepped up my game and researched and found some foods, some backpacking foods and dehydrated meals that I feel definitely made a difference this season for us and, and for me. Really? Yeah. I just, you know, instead of some of those meals that have a lot of fillers and maybe aren't as, as healthy, um, I found a couple that that I think have made a difference. I, I felt better. I felt stronger every day. I didn't bonk as quickly like I mentioned, we did 94 miles in Wyoming in eight days of hunting. And that's, you know, tracking on Onyx on foot. Yeah. And 
by the by the eighth day, I was I bonked that that evening. If we would have shot an elk right at dark, um, we may have had to find a different way to get it out because I don't know if physically I'd have been able to to do it. But up to that point, it was uh, it was incredible just to be able to go day after day and do that many miles. So are you willing to share with me some of these or do you want me to continue to deteriorate and have my health and my longevity suffer <laughs> because of the the poor quality of, or not poor quality, but the the inhuman consumption of fiber that and salts that I've been subjecting myself to, or, or is that like top secret that you're not going to share? Yeah, you know, I, I'll share with everybody else, but you're going to have to take your headset off for a minute while I share it. And <laughs> I just want to be able, I want to make sure I can keep up with you when we hunt together. Uh, you trust me, that won't be a problem. You know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, no uh, is, it a com- is it a company or is it something you're making and putting together yourself? No, it's, it's, uh, there's several companies and I think dehydrated foods, freeze dried foods have come a long way in the last uh, couple of years, especially. And there's a lot of new players in that market that are more conscientious to, um, nutrient rich foods that are healthy and uh, that are made to sustain you while you're putting out a lot of physical exertion in the backcountry. Uh, Mountain Ops mm-hmm. is one of the companies that's going to be bringing uh, those types of meals to the market in the near future. And I had an opportunity to test a couple of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peak, Peak Refuel, they're uh, another company oh, yeah. that's making other options that are super delicious. Uh, yeah, I grabbed some of their breakfast stuff. Yeah. Are they? I think they were the ones who made the raspberry and granola and the strawberry yep. and granola that I had. Yep, that's it. I, I I am on that. I'm I'm that that's tall. That's for me. I I usually look forward to the dinner, but uh, because the, I haven't found a good dinner replacement, I was eating more breakfast than I was dinner. But yep. Oh well. Yeah, they were good. They've got a couple that were that were really delicious. Uh, off grid food company, they're making healthy organic, you know, they've got quail and buffalo and other organic what? meats that they've sourced and they've got some good meals. Uh, Humble Foods is one that, that hasn't come out yet that I was able to sample some of that and they're all actually gluten free, uh, which, hmm. you know, I've been doing some gluten free, dairy free, sugar free and of course during hunt season, I, I let that slack a little bit and and I, I, it's been good. I, I'm certainly, you know, I wasn't planning on doing that forever. And I introduced some of those again at a very minimal level. And, but it's been good to, to, uh, to have those. And then, you know, backcountry fuel box, Cody Rich, uh, is doing the backcountry yeah. fuel box, which is a monthly subscription thing. And I signed up yeah. for that. And so I'm getting that. And through that, I've found a, a ton of other, uh, Green Belly makes a meal that's one third of your caloric daily intake mm-hmm. in uh, this super lightweight little bar that I pack that every day in my backpack. And uh, there's some other uh, Big Sur bar that was that was really good. So, uh, you know, Honey Stinger, just a, just a bunch of these different foods that I've been able to kind of build a, a really solid food list for going on a backcountry type hunt for eight days and and they're good, so it's not like I'm having to gag them down. Yeah, well, I was on Cody's podcast, Rich Outdoor Podcast, and he turned me on to that backcountry fuel box, and I took four of the boxes that he'd sent to New Mexico, and we just experimented. Everybody in the crew grabbed something different of what worked and what they liked, and everyone issued a report, but I'm grateful to Cody for... uh, for putting that together. It, that's where I found out about that peak breakfast uh, stuff. And uh, we're we're thankful that he's doing that because it's, it's definitely widened our horizons. But I, I'd be interested if people listening have other ideas. Marcus said he's going to start making some at home. Uh, I don't know how you make that stuff at home. I'm, I'm not that smart, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm to the point where I'm going to start doing something because I've... I calculated that uh, in New Mexico, I'd eaten my 25th day of 
of dehydrated food meals already this season and ah, I can't do that forever. I'm too old. That's a lot. Yeah. No, and, and I think it's it's, you know, dehydrated or freeze-dried food isn't necessarily the issue. It's the it's the ingredients they're putting into them that yep. you know, are the are the issue. So just getting that good balance of all the nutrients and what your body needs and you know, for me, calories this year were, were incredible. I was eating close to 3,000 calories a day and thought, I'm doing good. You know, I, I typically have sugary trail mix. I typically have a Snickers bar, you know, some of these things. And I cut all that out and uh, had, you know, dehydrated blueberries, dehydrated cranberries, sliced almonds, some of those things for trail mix. And, you know, my, my sweets came from honey stinger waffles, which are you know, more of a natural sugar from honey rather than a processed refined sugar. Yep. Uh, and so all of that, I was getting about 3000 calories a day and probably snacking on, on a, you know, a little granola bar here and there, something to, to supplement on the last day at about four o'clock, I had gone through all of my food in my pack yeah. and I had packed extra food that day, knowing we were going to be going steep and deep. And I turned to to Dirk and Donnie and said, hey, do you guys happen to have extra food? Did you bring anything extra? I'm starting to get a little shaky and I've eaten all my food. And fortunately, they had extras, but I ate another half of a green belly bar, which is probably 380 calories. And I ate another honey stinger waffle, which I think is 150 calories. Anyway, at the end of the day, I had consumed 4,000 calories and still felt weak. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you, you do that many miles in the back country and steep country. We were, we were leaving the truck at 6,000 or 6,200 feet and we were hunting at about 84 to 8,600 feet, topping out at about 8,900 feet mm. every day. So we had major elevation changes. We had major miles and my body needed, needed fuel. Yeah. Well, that, <clears throat> that gets us into one of the I think we've already started down the path. One of the topics that we wanted in this mid-season catch-up is uh, what's working. I think we talked about the Sitka Apex stuff working. Uh, sounds like you've come up with some some really good ideas on the the food, nutrition, energy, calories solution uh, or issue. Any other things on the what's working? Because I, I, I know you're like me, Corey. Every year you're tweaking and experimenting with something different. And uh, I, I'm just, I know our audience is always curious about what we're using and what we're trying and working on. But Totally. And I don't like change. So once I find something that works, you know, I get kind of stuck in that rut. But at the same time, I'm always open to improving what I have and, and finding where that weak link is. And I think, you know, food has been a weak link without maybe acknowledging it in the past. And so it's, it's been good to get that dialed in. Uh, on X, I, again, I just, you know, this isn't a, a cheap solicitation for the on X app, but it truly is a powerful tool for us out there. And so I think I mentioned, you know, blood trailing and things like that, but just, being able to look at it and say, okay, we're six and a half miles in here. We need to start thinking about how we're going to get back out. But what do we have between us and the and the vehicle or the trailhead? Where should we go? Where are the north facing slopes? Where are the elk going to be right now? And to be able to just pull that up on Onyx and say, oh, right over the ridge here, there's a north facing slope that runs all the way down. We can hit this ridge system. We can walk down it, hit the bottom and walk back out to the trailhead. You know, it just truly has replaced a GPS with so much more uh, just powerful features that that absolutely help us on our hunt. So that's been, you know, we're learning more about that. You can change colors of tracks in there so we can actually, you know, each day have a different color track so we can see where we were the day before. Um, you know, if we drive somewhere and we, you know, we're on a new road, we can put that in a certain color and we get out and start hiking. We can do that in a different color. So that's been Definitely learning uh, more about that and the, the powerful features that it has. Yeah, for me, I, I just, uh, I have now become so addicted to the aerial 
you know, the satellite view that I can't get on my handheld GPS. That yep. it's for me just that in itself is the game changer of what's what does it look like just over in that next basin? Oh well, I've downloaded my map, so I can tell you. And yep. That's it's amazing for me. One of the things that we've been using this year that has really been a, a, a big, I, for us anyhow, uh, especially when we're in a place like Alaska, uh, places that have quite a bit of water, is there's, I don't know what water filtration system you use, but I use a combination. I, mostly I use catadines. Sometimes I use platypuses. But catadine has this new thing called the bee, bee free, like B, B, E and then free, and it comes in a one liter and a three liter, and it has a built-in water filter. And as quick as we get to water, we just make sure those things get filled up. And so it's a bladder that in the mouthpiece, the whatever you want to call it, the, the drinking spout, the filter's right there. Oh, man, that's, that has really been slick for us. When we're so do you squeeze the bladder then to force the water through the filter? Either way, you can drink directly from it or you just, you can, if you squeeze the bladder really hard, you will end up with water coming out and, uh, you know, you can put it, use it for whatever, you give it to somebody else, share it to somebody else and uh, fill up their bladder, however you want to do it. But for us, we've just been filling the, the bladder with water, screw the lid back on, and that's what we've been drinking out of. Interesting. So how hard is it to squeeze the, the bladder and get water out? Not hard at all. Uh, it's got a cap on it. Once you pull the cap out, I mean, you got to give it a little bit of pressure, but if you tip it upside down and you, you squeeze that thing with your hands, there's going to be water spraying out of there just like a water bottle. Very cool. Now, we've used, uh, our camera guy had a platypus, uh, whatever the bag is that you, you know, you roll it, basically, you fill it with water like that, and then it's got the filter in the head, and then you squeeze it down into your water bottle or whatever. Yep. I think his had been, had had a lot of use, and so the filter was probably a little clogged, but my hands were okay. cramping up trying to roll that down and get water out of it. I have a Katie Dine Hiker Pro, and it's just a normal filter pump that you put in the water and pump and it pumps really fast and, and works good. But I'm actually sitting here on the computer looking at that yeah. Katadyne B free water filtration system and yeah. definitely intriguing. Yeah. That's, that's been one for me that has really worked this year. Uh, I can tell you what's not working is my, my e-scouting plan. <laughs> uh, for me to have uh, done a series with OnX on e-scouting, when they see my New Mexico hunt, they're going to be like, Newberg, it took you five days to get into the elk. What kind of e-scouting plan did you have put together? <laughs> and uh, we're going to show people. I mean, I went down there, and we were in the unit just north of where you and I had hunted a few years ago, and I'd never been there before. My my number one A spot, the monsoon had come and washed the road out. So here I am, truck, trailer with four llamas in it. We can't get in there. So instantly my A spot is crossed off. Go to my B spot. And I think it wasn't until we got to my D or E spot that we really started running into elk. And uh, but, but the takeaway there is you had a D and an E spot. Yeah. Yeah, and you and I have talked about this on past podcasts, and my camera crew is asking me, Randy, how long are you going to give this spot? And my guest hunter is asking the same thing. We went into some of these spots. We saw no tracks, no fresh droppings, no rubs. I said, this is all I'm giving this spot. I'm, I've only got seven days. I got to find some elk, and I'm not wasting three of these days by saying, oh, I know they're here somewhere. I pulled the plug. And we reset camp four different times on this hunt. And just what what I had to do. And I mean, my hunting was really my scouting or my scouting was part of my hunting, depending on how you want to say that. But I gave no place more than a day. I went in there, didn't hear anything, didn't, didn't see much. I'm like, you know what? There's got to be elk here somewhere, but this isn't the somewhere that they're at. So we hunted every corner of that very large unit before we stumbled into enough elk that we found worthwhile. 
Yeah, and I think that's the key is there is no reason to stumble around for three days. If you aren't seeing sign and aren't seeing elk, you're not in the right place. And they aren't going to just magically appear overnight. You know, bugles, yes, they might be there and they might not be bugling. And the next day or two days later, they might start bugling and fire up. But if you aren't seeing that sign, fresh sign tracks and droppings and rubs, relocate immediately because you're not in the right area. Yeah. Well, then <clears throat> we may, I made a huge mistake uh, uh, I think it was the fourth or fifth day, fourth day, we talked to a BLM person and he said, yeah, they got the road fixed going into that spot. They fixed it today. So that was my A spot and it had a trailhead and my goal was park at the trailhead and we're going to take the llamas in six miles. So we get there that night. Yeah, the road had been repaired. We stake out our llamas, set up our camp, and we get up really early in the morning, right at the trailhead. And we're packing the llamas, and there's two bulls bugling across probably three-quarter of a mile from us. And everyone's looking at each other like, boy, imagine how many elk are going to be six miles in here if they're bugling at the trailhead. <laughs> well... <clears throat> I, we should have just went right after those elk right there and not finished packing our llamas. We should have just said, you know what? We can come back and do this in the daylight. Yep. Well, I didn't do that. Finally, it gets light. We get the llamas all packed up and we make a loop over there. Well, by this time it's 9 or 8.30 in the morning. Well, when you're having those warm 85 degree days, they're heading to their beds early. And so... We, we never got a response out of those elk once they went to their beds. And what did we do? We left elk to find elk. So we take the llamas in six miles, one way, fully loaded, carrying water, carrying all of our production gear, and we did not hear a bugle in there. <laughs> I... I know the. I mean, whether you're fishing or hunting, you don't leave fish to find fish. You don't leave bugling elk to find bugling elk. You stay there and you work those ones. And if that doesn't work out or you mess it up, well, then you go somewhere else. That was such an amateur move on my part, Corey. I, <laughs> all I could do is well, I, <laughs> turn to the camera and say, guys, I screwed it up. I, I, you know, <laughs> I should know better as many years I've been hunting elk, but that's what I did. Totally. We we had a similar situation in Wyoming and, and we know it. We've hunted there in the past. Um, it's good early because the bulls haven't herded up yet and they're really, they're separated, but they're close by. So you can hit ridge after ridge and find, you know, a solo bull, a solo bull. And I think it was the second day, first or second day. Uh, our camera guy started laughing and he's like, that has to be the best line from this season so far. And I said, what? And he said, you just said you're taking inventory of elk. And we were kind of doing that. We were hitting the ridge and we're running and bugling and getting an answer and moving on to another one and kind of doing what you're talking about, leaving elk to find elk. And I told him, you know, it's part of my strategy. I'm, I'm taking inventory to find out where these bulls are. And of course, when we came back, they weren't there. They weren't bugling there and it backfired on us a little bit as well. But I, I thought it was really cool that we were taking inventory and we're marking down where all these elk were. And uh, like you said, if you get an elk bugling, there's no, no point in doing more scouting that day, go and hunt. And then if you need to scout from there, you can, you can scout the next day. Yeah. Or get up earlier and go in the dark and do more inventory counting. Yep. Uh, I, I just, I kicked myself because those two bulls were really getting with it. And you know how it is. That's one of the things you hope for is that you end up, you know, you can put yourself between two bulls that want to show off. It's like, that was such a perfect setup. And what did I do? I stayed at the trailhead packing our gear and getting our llamas loaded, thinking, oh, six miles in, there will be 12 bulls bugling, not just two. <laughs> well, we got in there and... It it was just way drier than expected. It's amazing how localized the monsoon was down there. At the trailhead in west, it was all green. And where we went in, it was pretty much brown. And for an elk to transport himself or move five or six miles or a cow for better food, that, that happens all the time. 
I mean, those cows are going where the best food is, and it may not be in the drainage that you've put on your e-scouting plan, so you better be ready to to move and adapt. And Totally. I, I think one of the things that did work for that hunt, we had seven days. I had a spot on my map for every day if need be. And because I had a plan and I was confident in it, I didn't have any second thoughts about pulling stakes and moving camp four times every day, be in a different place. Whereas if I didn't have a plan put together, I probably would have just hung out, said, oh, they got to be here somewhere. And my hunt would have been over and I wouldn't yep. have seen any elk. No, and, that, and that's hard because we had opportunities too to, to pull up and move to different areas. And it's hard because you get your camp set up, you get comfortable there. And you kind of get in that rut of, we're going to hunt close to camp instead of branching out. And so we always carry a, a bivy pack with us in the truck. So it's just a pack that's got a lightweight tent, lightweight sleeping bag, a stove, some dehydrated meals, so that we can jump in the truck and not necessarily relocate camp, but we can go and set up a temporary camp 30 miles away. And if we find elk, then we can make the decision whether to camp uncomfortably or go and pull roots and and come back. Yeah. Well, what we did on day five is I just sat down and did in kind of what you were saying in inventory. I said, all right, we got two days left. Where are the places we saw the most sign, heard the most bugles? It just it seemed to be more appealing. And those are the places we're going to focus our last two days. And the last two days we had really close encounters. It, you know, sometimes it's just bad luck. Uh, sometimes it just, you know, doesn't work out. But the last two days, once we kind of did that assessment and said, all right, here's how much we've, I guess, eliminated of the unit. Here are the two small areas we're going to focus on. We, we had a really good hunt the last two days. So, but that's, that's how life goes. So you've been to Oregon, you've been to Wyoming. Yep. Where, what else you got? Uh, we're leaving tomorrow morning to go and participate in the hunt winner hunt that we gave away with Mountain Ops last year. So uh, Elk 101 teamed up with Mountain Ops and uh, to help promote the University of Elk Hunting online course, we uh, gave away a, a pretty sweet prize package that included uh, me tagging along on a elk hunt for five days with the winner. Wow. So we're leaving tomorrow morning for that and meeting the guest hunter uh, near the location we're hunting here in Idaho and then spending uh, the next five days with him. And I think it's going to be a pretty cool story because if uh, if I understand correctly, he's hunted elk nine or ten times and has yet to kill one. Oh, cool. So there's, wow. a, there's some pressure there to, to help him fill his first tag, but also uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to... To be able to, you know, we're, we're doing the day-by-day -day hunting series on YouTube starting in November, and so this will be part of it. But to be able to take somebody like that that maybe doesn't have the, the experience, um, especially hunting bugling bulls during the rut, and be able to share some of what we love about elk hunting and, and uh, some of that passion and experience with him, uh, I think there's going to be some, some definite educational components there that will be pretty valuable to those who watch the series when it comes out in November. Yeah. So where's he from? Uh, he's from Texas. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah. He uh, he's going to get shown a good time. I'm sure of that. Well, so. it should be good because this week is just shaping up to be prime. The weather's supposed to drop about 12 degrees tomorrow, which I think that's been our nemesis this elk season is just the heat <laughs> yeah. and the dry weather. We haven't had any moisture the highs have been up into the 80s even over on the oregon coast when we hunted there in the back country of wyoming there were a couple of days it got into the 80s and the elk just aren't active and you can tell in their bugles and everything it's it's too hot we just we don't want to get going yet so i think with the temperature dropping 12 degrees tomorrow uh, we're at about half moon going into a full moon so we've got about a week here of of good moon phase and then we've got the fall equinox that hits uh, i believe friday of this week on the 21st which usually triggers the peak rut so all of those things coming together i think the next seven days should be pretty good from a from a calling and rutting action standpoint well i hope so it'd be fun to take somebody and and do that i 
I always tell people I have way more fun helping someone take their first elk than if I was to shoot another elk myself. Totally. Yep. Speaking of of giveaways, uh, you mind if I throw in a little plug here? Remember how I told you I'd probably not do any more sweepstakes? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just thinking that when I, you know, we're leaving tomorrow and it's it's going to be a ton of fun, but the selfish side of me is saying, gosh, this is the week I would want to be out chasing <laughs> elk for myself. And and we lock us into those situations where we're, we're out hunting with someone else. And uh, you and I have talked in the past that we're not doing any more of that, but... Yeah, go ahead. Share with us what you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We say we're not doing any more of that. And what are you doing tomorrow? You're going to do one. And the Elk Foundation called me and the folks at OnX called me and they said, Randy, would you do an elk hunt sweepstakes for 2019? And as my mind gets all excited about maybe helping someone kill their first elk. I completely forget about the pact you and I made that we weren't doing any more sweepstakes hunts. And the first <laughs> words out of my mouth were, sure, let's do that. <laughs> so if people want to enter that sweepstakes for 2019, we're doing it as a rifle hunt. Uh, a lot of people have asked if we could do it as an archery hunt, unfortunately. And people are going to say, how can your calendar get filled this far in advance? But my September calendar next year is already filled. So I'm, I'm not well, able did to... You, did you save a spot for me in, in that calendar? Well, we can negotiate that. I mean, the slots are for sale. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but so anyhow, uh, the, the way to enter, you can go out to onxmaps.com uh, or go to rmef.org. They have the links out there. If you want to see the video with all the details of it, you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, we just posted up a video the other day about how you win this elk hunt. And it's, we're going to apply them in Wyoming in January, whoever the winner is. If they don't draw there, we're going to apply them in Montana. And if they don't draw there, we've got the fallback option of an over-the-counter hunt in October or in uh, November in Colorado. So we're going somehow, and that includes travel, Sitka gears, throwing in a whole set of gear for them. Uh, we'll provide everything. So <clears throat> hopefully some people will sign up. Uh, I don't know. They might say, hunting with Newberg? No, thanks. And I promise <laughs> after you just got done telling them it took you five days to find the elk in New Mexico. That's... I know. They're, it's a five day <laughs> hunt. They're probably going to say, well, if it took him five days to find elk in the peak rut, why would I want to go with him in a post rut or late hunt? <laughs> but I can not promise you somewhere along the way, we will find a Dairy Queen. So, I mean, it, it might be a glorified Dairy Queen visit, but I, I think we'll have fun. That's awesome. So from there then, so you're doing all this, and we don't want to let the cat out of the bag, Corey, but you're going to take this season that you're doing here, and then it's going to be on your Elk 101 YouTube channel in November? Yeah, so we're basically, we're filming, uh, what we've always done in the past has been, you know, more film style, where it's a 20 or 25 minute film that shows the highlights of the season and some of the action, and it usually has a theme. We don't ever set the theme ahead of time, but typically, you know, there's some kind of a hardship or some kind of epic action or something that that ends up being the theme of that film. And this year we really wanted to capitalize on sharing the educational side of it. Because we get a lot of, you know, we share these films and people say, well, I, you know, I learned this or I learned that, but I want to hear a play-by-play -play of what you're doing. You know, even if we sit down after the hunt and go through and just do audio voiceover and explain why we did this, why we did that. And those aren't, I don't feel there's as much value in those or they aren't as helpful as in the moment talking about it. So that's been our focus this year is having a camera guy. We're mic'd up, we're wired up with, with microphones. We've got a, a selfie cam for the caller who's back behind and he's talking to the camera the whole time saying, the bull just responded, I'm going to cut him off. I'm raking a tree, I'm doing this. And then the camera over the shoulder so the shooter is able to talk and, and explain what he's seeing and what's going on. And it's going to be day by day. So it's more documentary style, you know, starting August 25th when we hunted opening day in Oregon for Roosevelt Elk all the way through the first week of October when we go and uh, hunt with the hunt of a lifetime uh, hunter who's coming out from Pennsylvania, uh, we're going to be able to take the viewers 
into each day of our hunt and see what we're doing in the morning, how we're getting into the areas, how we're locating elk, how we're setting up, how we're trying to call them in. You know, they're going to see some pretty epic fails and hopefully there'll be a few successes to share along the way. Um, but they're going to they're going to get to see it all and it's going to be pretty raw and unedited and just kind of hopefully feel like they're right there with us hunting. Cool. Well, we've been doing a lot of day by day hunts if you want to call it that. We just do them by the hunt. We don't do a whole season and what we've found is out on YouTube uh folks like that style. They they don't necessarily want this highly polished, full of music sort of thing. And we just show the struggles and the challenges and let the chips fall where they may. And yep. it, 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 it's fun to do it that way because it, it's just real. It's it just, this is what happened. Like my New Mexico hunt that they're going to see, I, I just admit, you know, <laughs> yeah, even though I have these platforms, doesn't make me the world's greatest expert. Look, I, I've spent most of the summer researching this and I show up and everything's different than I expected. That is just how it is. And, uh, yep. so as boring as it might be the first few days of this day by day, New Mexico hunt, I hope the, the audience looks at it as the lesson of here's how you try to get through a challenging hunt. Everyone wants to have these perfect, hey, I showed up, everything went according to plan, the elk read the script. But that's the exception, not the rule. So this will be, here's how we fight through it. Here's how we continue to push forward, yep. even though it looks pretty bleak. No, and I think there's value. You know, I think with uh, with outdoor TV and, and where it's been forever, it's always been the glorified, you know, kill shot, um, the grip and grin, all of that. And I think that with YouTube especially and, and some of the other platforms where we can share some of this media now, people want to learn. They want to see behind the scenes. They want to be involved with more than just the, the pull of the trigger. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's some trigger pulling to, <laughs> to show success and to actually put some uh, success behind the efforts. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how much uh, attention we captivate. Because it's going to end up being, I would guess, uh, in the neighborhood of 24 to 28 days of day by day. Each day we'll launch a new day and it'll go start November 12th on the Elk 101 YouTube channel and go every day until we're done elk hunting. So cool. Yeah, if you're if you're listening, definitely go and subscribe to the Elk 101 YouTube channel, and that way you get the notification as soon as it's up, and set your calendar for November 12th because that's when uh, day one launches. Yeah, well, go do that, folks. You'll you'll enjoy it, I'm sure. And it's interesting that you will have wrapped up most of your elk hunting by what October sometime. Yeah, the hunt of a lifetime hunt I think ends on October 7th. Uh, but from there, you know, and, and we may throw in some more uh, of the hunts that we do, but I'll be focusing more on my kids. Um, there's a, a spike rifle season that opens October 5th through the 14th here in Idaho that they'll be able to to go out and hunt, which both of them have already said they aren't too sure if they want to shoot a spike. Um, hmm. the, the two youngest who haven't shot an elk yet. Yeah. And then uh, the general rifle opens October 15th and I think goes through November 3rd or something. So we'll, we'll get out a handful of times in there and, and uh, just depending on how it goes, we may have another day or two of footage to be able to share from that. Yeah. Well, we, we did New Mexico. Uh, I, my crew here, Michael and Dan and Marcus, I've sent them out every day since we've got home. I told them your job is you have to go elk hunting every morning between now and October 1st or you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> so they're out right now uh, chasing elk here in, in Montana. Uh, yesterday they reported to me that they found eight grouse, eight, and they got zero. I, I told them. Hold on, they got zero or they, they didn't got, even they, they try? They ended up with zero grouse out of eight. That, I asked them, I'm like, how can you not kill at least half of those? You should have had four grouse. They gave me the kind of mush mouth answer. I told them that's another grounds for getting fired. 
is not getting at least half the grouse you encounter. So I I don't know. I got to go to Colorado and then Wyoming. Otherwise, I'd be out there on grouse detail. I'd just tell them, you guys leave the grouse to me. But, oh, well, I had duty calls. So Man. I know. So once we do that, once they're done here, then we really get into the elk hunting. We've got two Montana elk hunts or a, a rifle elk hunts, both of them in Montana in October. And then we've got Wyoming. We've got two really good elk tags there, my son and my uncle. Those are November tags. So we'll really be picking up our elk hunting starting in October, about the time you're winding down. So yeah, hopefully I'll have a few stories to tell. Uh, most people who know me will say, yeah, that, that's right, Newberg. Those are stories. There's not much truth there. You're you're full of it. So. <laughs> But, uh, uh, no, that's, you know, and that's, I think, at least in my view, that's your strength is that late season post rut elk hunting. I know I've learned more about that time frame and, and how to hunt elk from you than I've ever encountered or, or experienced on my own. And so, uh, I'll be anxiously waiting to see how that goes for you. Uh, I hope it goes well. And, and part of that is just, that's where I kind of learned and made all my mistakes was mostly in rifle hunting in the post rut period in the late season. And so when I go with you uh, and we're hunting these archery hunts, I'm taking serious notes. I don't really even care if I shoot anything. I'm just taking notes. So I guess we'll, we'll call that a trade off. Uh, so uh you were in wyoming uh my guys are here hunting in montana this week they're hunting in grizzly bear country um there's been a tragic event happened last week in wyoming sad to read about it Uh, a lot of people i think listening have probably read about that guide outside of jackson hole got him and his client got mauled by a, a grizzly bear and it ended up where this it's just hard to even think about someone uh dying at the hands of a grizzly bear have five kids you just feel sad and it's i i just feel for what his family must go through but what it has generated a ton of emails for me i don't know about you but people asking about hunting in grizzly country and i don't know if where you were at in wyoming this year if that was grizzly country or not but uh it definitely is something that you have to be aware of in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming if you're going to hunt elk in the rut, especially. Definitely. Yeah, and, you know, reading about it, there's, it's hard to say, but it sounds like they had bear spray, they had a, a firearm, you know, all the precautions that you'd want to have with you, and things just happen. I mean, they happen out there, and it's, uh, even if you're prepared for it, Things happen, but I think being prepared for it is is the first step and understanding the risks and and trying to minimize those risks is vital. Yeah, and for for us, every time we hunt in grizzly country, we try to do some informational pieces about what we're doing. And I subscribe to the theory of the best way that I know of is to do everything you can to avoid an encounter, first of all. But like you said, sometimes it just, you really end up in the wrong end of a bad luck situation, no matter how hard you try. I've, I've done everything I can many times to avoid it, but I've had twice where it ended up with me and a grizzly bear, you know, 20 yards apart. And for me, fortunately, both times turned out positive and the bear went the other direction. But for me, it's about keeping clean camps, stuff like that. But, you know, when you're there from the reports anyhow they were processing an elk out in the field and something happened not all the details obviously aren't yet clear but yeah it doesn't sound like they were actually processing it sounds like they'd shot one the night before and went back the next day to recover it yeah and yeah. just walking into it two bears attacked them and the oh, bears that, had... they, they were just walking into it okay i i i might have made some assumptions when i read it i thought they were they'd found the elk and they were uh 
field dressing it or something. Yeah, which which oh. is always a concern. You know, grizzlies, if they find an elk, they'll claim it. And obviously, once a grizzly claims it, you you have lost claim to it. Yeah. But it sounds like they were either tracking or going back in. And these two grizzlies just came out of nowhere and hit them. And, and it sounds like the grizzlies hadn't even touched the elk or been to the elk at that point uh, when it oh. happened. And, and I think that's the thing. You know, we, we think we're prepared. We have bear spray on our on our holster on our hip and if i see a bear at 70 yards and we have a face off and it decides to charge i'm going to be ready i'll have you know pistol drawn i'll, I'll have whatever it is but so many times they come out of nowhere and, and there's no warning there's no advance warning it's just it happens and you know we, we're doing all the things wrong hunting we're trying to be quiet we're walking with the wind in our face yeah uh, we're calling like a like a prey animal and so all these things that really it's hard to to scare a grizzly away because that's the the thing we're trying not to do is scare things away and <laughs> i think yeah. so many times we do end up in those situations where it's just a split second and things happen before you can react yeah the I people have asked me, is it going to change my outlook on hunting in grizzly country? And the answer is no. Uh, I've lived in Montana 27 years, and every year we have a couple situations here. Wyoming seems to have quite a few more than we have. But some of my best elk hunting is in the core of grizzly habitat. And I'm as tragic as that is for that family. For, as it relates to my hunting, I'm going to continue to hunt how I do. It's a reminder to me that, you know, you can be as prepared as you want. This guide in Wyoming, I'm sure, had spent many years in the backcountry with grizzly bears, and I accept the risk. I hope it never comes to be reality, but the pleasures I get in chasing elk, and I want to chase them where there are more of them and that there's older age classes, that makes my compass head towards these spots that the grizzly bears also seem to inhabit. And I, I guess the, the answer I'm providing is, no, it's not going to change my habit of hunting in grizzly country, but it does serve as a reminder that you just, you know, you do everything you can to avoid it and prevent it, but accept the risk that, even as prepared as you might be, it might not be enough. Yep. No, I think just, you know, having, like you said, keeping a clean camp and keeping food out of camp, you definitely don't want to dig up to your elbows in a dehydrated food pouch and climb into your sleeping bag in the tent and set the pouch outside the tent, you know, like you might do somewhere where there's not grizzlies. You, you definitely take all those precautions. You carry whatever you're comfortable with, whether it's bear spray or a, a firearm, uh, so if you do have that encounter, you're, you're prepared. Um, and I know for us, when we're hunting grizzly country, our senses are just so much more heightened and, and we're on so much more alert, especially hiking in, in the dark in the morning or out in the dark in the, at night, uh, you know, you get in those Creek bottoms where there's willows and you're going through and can't see three feet in front of your face. You're thinking more, you're stopping and listening more. Um, I think just being, being aware that you're in grizzly country, there could be a, an encounter and, and trying to minimize those encounters and being prepared at all times for them is definitely important. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, the part for me, I always, I'd say the time I get the most unnerved is once we have an animal on the ground and we're cutting it up and we're hanging the meat, that whole period, I'm somewhat unnerved, but then if we have to come in for a second trip, and, and usually we do, and I know that carcass has been laying there and that meat, even though I hang the meat 300 yards or, you know, whatever distance away from the carcass and the, the gut piles, when I come back in that second time, that's probably when I'm on the highest alert. It's like, yep. oh, gosh. And I never go in and get that second load in the dark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we could say that we, uh, we shot an elk and it was right before dark and it took us till probably nine thirty or 10 o'clock to get it broken down and put in the game bags. And we're prepared to, to haul out a pretty substantial load on the first trip, but there were still two quarters that were left. And so we packed them 200 yards down the ridge, put them along the trail there and, and set them, uh, is down in some willows 
Uh, we broke out of the willows. There's kind of an open hillside. And we set them there on a log. And we made the trip out. And it was about probably 1 or one thirty in the morning. We went back in for the second trip, hmm. uh, the second load. And walking in there, we're tired. We've been hunting all day. It's, you know, middle of the night. And we've got our headlamps on. We come around the corner and look up. And the game bags have reflectors on them. Yep. And that works really good for being able to spot the game bags in the dark, but it also works really well at giving the appearance of two eyeballs looking back at you from the edge of the willows. <laughs> and uh, I, I would be lying if I said that a couple of firearms weren't drawn and uh, bear spray was was in hand. It's just one of the, you know, you're, you're walking up there, it's dark, it's open, and all, or it's, it's brushy, and all of a sudden you break out into the open and look up with your headlamp, and there's two silver reflectors about eye with the part looking back at you from where you know the elk meat is it uh it gets the heart racing a bit but yeah. fortunately that was uh our only encounter with potential bear on the meat after we'd left it and gone back to retrieve it in the dark and we uh quickly loaded on the packs and walked very quickly back out of there yeah i just i i've thought about that before and i've just always told myself you know what Go in. I, my hearing's already compromised due to old age and abuse of my ears. So I'm going in there with mostly visual acuity. I, I want to be able to see. And I, I don't know. That, that's just how I do it. I know other people would probably say, Newberg, you're a wuss. Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> but <laughs> it just, oh, well. So, you, so I, don't, I don't know if we want to get too political, but I, I found it interesting that about the same time as the the attack happened last week in Wyoming, the uh, first grizzly bear hunt that had been slated to start in Idaho and Wyoming was uh, blocked by the judge. U.S. District Judge, yeah. uh, be able to do more review on it and determine if they really were ready to be delisted or not. Yeah. You know, things like this. Uh, eh, it's not like it's going to prevent attacks from happening, but I think once you're able to start hunting a predator, um, hopefully it'll instill a little bit of respect in them and and uh, maybe keep them at bay and keep the populations in check. Because right now, it's there's no doubt, if you hunt in grizzly country in Montana or Wyoming especially, there, there are so many grizzlies. It really, it isn't like you're seeing one track every seven days. No. We saw five grizzlies on one hillside at one time in Wyoming when we were hunting there. Yeah. I, and so it's... Uh, I think people completely miss how, how their density is. And that's why they're expanding and expanding as their core habitat is completely saturated with what it can handle of grizzly bears and you get into their core places there are a lot of them and yeah. they're not accustomed to having to accommodate you they expect you to accommodate them and they're they're called horribilis i think ursa horribilis is horrible uh is, yep. they're called that for a reason uh they have an attitude and this time of year, what is it? Hyperphagia, I think, is the term. They're, yep, they're putting on the feed bag in a big way. So, but uh, that's yeah. There's some definitely some. I don't know if irony is the right word or coincidence or just bad timing or whatever. But to have that court case and that mauling death happen within days of each other. Definitely has the grizzly bear issue high on everyone's radar list at this point. So Front and center, yep. Yeah, unfortunately, the rest of our hunts uh, this fall are, are not in grizzly country, and we'll be able to sleep easy at night and not have that risk. But it, it's, you know, and like you mentioned, some of the best hunting and the least amount of hunting pressure are in those areas where there are grizzlies. And so you just have to weigh the the risk versus reward. And it's not like you're carelessly and recklessly going in there saying there's no other hunters, you know, I'm going to take this risk and, and hope it works out. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's something to consider as you're planning a hunt. Is it grizzly country? And, and what am I going to do to make sure I'm prepared? Yeah. 
Uh, our two rifle hunts are right on the fringe. The October rifle hunts in Montana are on the fringe. There's occasional grizzly that goes through there, but it's not in the core habitat. So I, I won't be that on un, un, uh, alert for grizzlies there, but it just part of what what I accept in the places that I like to hunt. So, but uh, one thing I want to get to here before we wrap up, I had it written on my notes is hunting elk when it's 85 degrees. Um, in New Mexico, we had highs ranging. I think one day it was 84, another day. It, it was always bouncing between 84 and 86 degrees. And my experience was we had a perfect, moon phase it was a new moon we'd had a serious monsoon that washed out the roads the week before we got there so there was water in every little mud puddle there was water in every low spot every depression uh uh, it just seems that and not just this hunt but when you and i hunted down there two years ago when i've hunted in montana when it's been really hot the elk are starting to do their thing but they're doing it at night uh, they they were done talking and they were in their beds within a half hour after the sun coming up and they weren't getting out of their beds until 20 minutes before the end of shooting light and i don't know i don't have a solution to that <laughs> You got any thoughts? You know, I, any solutions? Yeah, to that? I think we 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 encountered the same thing both in Oregon and in Wyoming, and you know we've talked a lot about moon phase and that hunting on a full moon is tough because they go to bed earlier in the morning because they're able to stay out all night, and in the evening they come out of their beds later because the same reason. Uh, but hunting midday can be really good on a full moon during certain times of the year, if if it aligns that way, because the bulls especially get restless and they don't like to sit in their bed for 12 hours. And and so that midday hunting can be good. The problem with the heat, it has the same effect as the full moon. It sends them to bed earlier because it gets hotter sooner in the morning and then it stays hotter later in the evening. So they don't come out as much. The problem with it that we found, especially in Wyoming, was there was no moon. It was a dark moon. And they weren't talking at night either. Yeah. And so midday action was, was tough because it's 84 degrees and those bulls, it's harder to get them fired up and, and out. So the, it seemed like things just weren't happening. It was hot and dry. Uh, that's the thing. We didn't have any monsoons in Wyoming, so it was just crunchy, dry. Uh, water was very limited. Wallows were dried up. And so I, I think, you know, for, I would rather hunt on a full moon than hunt early when it's hot and dry like that, just because you don't have that midday option a lot of times that you'll have on the full moon and those elk are just, they're locked into their beds. So, I mean, really you have to take advantage of knowing where they are, being on them at daylight and hunting as hard as you can for that hour and knowing that the rest of the day is going to be pretty ineffective. Yeah. Well, and for me, I could have easily written off that there are no elk here, but in the two places <laughs> we ended up as our final spots for the last two days, we knew there were elk in there because we were seeing lots of sign, lots of tracks. They weren't saying anything. They weren't bugling just because of what you mentioned, and we couldn't get them to respond to a bugle in midday to save our lives, but... We knew they were there, so we kept hunting. Finally, the the last uh, evening of our hunt, it clouded over, and the temps dropped 10, 15 degrees. And that was our one day where it was, you just think, did I go to a different spot today? Where, where were all these elk <laughs> the last couple of days? But Yep, that light switch just gets tripped, and it is. It's literally overnight, and it can be something as simple as cloud cover or a temperature drop. Just any of those changes will trigger the elk. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I committed uh, blasphemy, if you want to call it that. I hate sitting water, and I told my crew <laughs> that I would rather stick my bare naked butt in a pot of hot fryer grease as to spend 10 minutes sitting in a blind waiting for an elk to come to a water hole. But I even resorted to that. 
That that's how. Which is hard when you've got the monsoons and there's water sitting everywhere. It's they just don't concentrate around water sources near as much. Yep. So I tried everything. Uh, my tag's still in my pocket, but we did have some close encounters. Um, I thought I was going to get to try a frontal shot. Uh, I had a a little raghorn come running in. We called, We have you ever done this thing? My camera guy, Marcus, calls it a cow party. Whenever he, he glasses up a, a raghorn or a younger bull, they just cow call like crazy. And we saw this group of seven raghorns and small five points. So we climbed out on this ridge and three of us just started whining on the cow calls. Five of those bulls came in, five of the seven, on the run. I thought we called in some cattle. There, you can hear this coming through the juniper pinion stuff. And the next thing, I look up, and 12 yards away, right behind this great big pinion tree, is this raghorn looking like, where is it? Where is it? I know it's here somewhere. And uh, I... I decided, you know, if he walked around that tree, he's only going to be about five or six yards away. I might try a frontal shot then, but I'm I'm not a accomplished enough archer to, to do it at a distance much more than that. But it was, uh, it was interesting to see five bulls come run, literally running. You could hear them coming. I, I'd never experienced that before. <laughs> they were, sounds like they were, uh, younger elk, and they're probably coming in asking the question, are you my mommy? That's probably what it was. They were not, uh, <laughs> they weren't big old mature bulls, uh, which is part of why we decided to do this. We knew they were all exactly. two and a half and three and a half year old bulls. And uh, boy, that was, <laughs> that was interesting to to, we didn't see them coming. You could hear them coming. And you know how that thick pinion juniper is. You don't see them yeah. until, well, I thought I was going to have an extra minute or two to find some shooting lanes, but no, he was. And then naturally they come in from behind you instead of the way you think they're going to come in. But yep. So that that was the extent of, of that hunt. And it was really the the day that it it cooled off that, I think they came in, that was about 9.30 in the morning and the sun was coming up about 6.30. So we got them up out of their beds and and they came on the dead run, literally. <laughs> well, on the live yep. run, none of them were dead. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. Uh, No, and for us, it was uh, it was tough that we had to get the elk to bugle. They, you know, we didn't hear hardly any bugles on their own, which usually in Wyoming that week that we're there, it's, uh, they're bugling on their own pretty good. Yeah. And it was Thursday morning, which on the calendar, I guess would have been the 13th and then Friday the 14th that they really, the, the light switch hit over there for them and they started talking on their own. They were bugling until 10 o'clock in the morning, sometimes on their own. Um, we got some midday action going, especially later. Usually we like that midday, you know, noon to two o'clock this year, it seemed over there that they were bedded down and they were pretty quiet, but about two thirty, three o'clock, they started getting a little bit restless and we were able to have some success calling them then, but it definitely turned on better. Um, I'd love to be there this week. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful that here in Idaho where we're going uh, with weather change that it's, it's going to be really good here over the next seven days. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a great hunt. Um, we're going to have to, uh, I don't, I don't know how we're going to connect again. Our schedules are so crazy between now going forward. So hopefully the audience will give us a mulligan or two that, uh, <laughs> hey, we understand, guys, because the number one thing we want all of you to do is make sure at this time of year you are out enjoying this. We wait 11 months for this prime period, and it's here. So hopefully they're out doing it, and they understand that if there's a – we we miss a week or something in the podcast that uh, it's because we're out quote unquote doing it. And yep. No, and I think uh, we've we've got a couple opportunities. Hopefully for some more podcast content here. We had a a bit of a situation in Oregon hunting Roosevelt elk that required some uh, backcountry emergency first aid and uh, transporting a, a person out of the backcountry. Uh, 
I'll get hopefully an opportunity here really soon to talk with David Brinker and share that experience and some of the lessons we learned there and and uh, some of things to do hopefully to prevent it as well as to be prepared for it. But uh, definitely some uh, some good information there that hopefully we're able to connect sooner than later and share that and then uh, some other opportunities to talk about elk hunts and strategies. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I've got some guys here in Montana that uh, because it's impossible for you and I to get together with all these guests, uh, I'll probably grab them and do the, the podcast myself with them. But there's some fun people who are here elk hunting that I'm trying to corner them for a podcast. Uh, I... I'm afraid that they, they think I'm going to tell about their honey hole or something. And they're like, God, that New- <laughs> Newberg and his big mouth, you don't want to be on his platforms. People know where you're <laughs> killing these big elk. But it's, uh, for yeah. me, the fun part of this year is everybody I run into, I get a little bit of a debriefing of what they've been encountering and where they've been. And to me, that's, that's helpful in how I'm viewing what's going on out there and adapting and adjusting what I'm I'm hunting because next week when I get back in Montana I'm I told the crew I'm hunting every morning next week uh you guys hunt every morning this week so the grouse are in trouble next week that's right (laughs) (laughs) well I did manage to uh to bring a couple grouse back to camp while we were in Wyoming and uh I'm pretty sure in the video I mentioned that they were uh for you and we went ahead and <laughs> ate them I, I didn't save them for you but we did hunt them and shoot them for you with you in mind so well I, the, the elk I season hasn't been a complete that. loss <laughs> I, I i could taste it already even though i didn't get to eat any of it but <laughs> so what one last thing before we uh we give up here uh on a prior podcast we'd mentioned this RMEF project in uh, South Central Colorado in the San Luis Valley called Middle Creek. Yeah. And a bunch of people were asking me more questions about it. Um, And if you have the Onyx system and you click on the layer on that says RMEF properties, what those are, they're not properties owned by RMEF. It's properties RMEF has acquired and turned over to either the Forest Service, the BLM, or the state agency. And so you'll see this Middle Creek one. And one thing I forgot to mention when we first discussed that a couple podcasts ago is the funding for RMEF to complete that project was mostly provided by Bass Pro Shops. And uh, it's that kind of support that helps RMEF do a project like this. And they bought 28 acres and that 28 acres is where a county or a a little two track road went through and blocked access. There was a gate on it. Well, RMEF acquires this, turns it over, I believe to the BLM. Yeah. The BLM gets rid of the gate and now there's 8,500 acres of Forest Service and BLM land behind that 28 acres that the public now has access to. And I hope there are some people down in Colorado right now hunting that property and shooting elk on it because it's it's a classic example of uh, what, uh, when, when we say hunting is conservation uh, and what their membership and what their donations and volunteerism does to help access elk country and uh since i totally and i think we'd received a lot of times so, we look so many questions about where that was i thought well i'm gonna give them the easy way to find it uh look at it on your onyx system and you'll definitely see it yep yeah there's so many layers on there that i didn't even realize and in fact i was reading the last issue of bugle magazine that came last month and and uh it mentioned something about the Onyx layer system. So I opened it up and went in there and found the property they were talking about, which I believe was in Washington in the, in the Blues Mountains. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool to open that up and click on that layer and see all the properties that they've been involved in, in either creating access, opening access, um, restoring habitat, doing all those things. And I think we look at private land and public land and we think it's a, it's black and white. Here's public land, here's private land. But so many times access to that public land is being denied because of the location of the private land. And, 
And so to have, you know, 28 acres doesn't seem like that big of an acquisition and doesn't do much for elk hunters. But when that 28 acres is locking up thousands and thousands of acres behind it and they can free up that that pinch point, that lock point and be able to open all of those thousands of acres behind it, it's uh, those are huge wins for for hunters. Yeah. So that's, we always want to let people know how their, uh, their time, talent, and money that they put towards the Elk Foundation, how it's tangible results for those of us who hunt. And that Colorado one is a, a good example. There's, I just, I called over to headquarters and said, hey, what's the number of acres that you've improved access to as of today? And they said, right now we're at 1.2 million acres. That's a lot of elk hunting ground that now has either access that wasn't there before or improved the access that was there. So, yep, cool stuff for those of us who own it is. land. So. Awesome. Are we ready for the uh, Sitka gear question of the episode? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think we are. Do you have it? I do. Yep. Okay. So this comes actually uh, so for anybody who listens, who's listening. Be sure and go to the Elk Talk Podcast uh, website, which is elktalkpodcast.com. And there is a contact section there where you can send us an email if you have thoughts for topics, if you have questions. Uh, and this one actually comes from, uh, from that source. And one of the listeners, Bryce, sent a question and he said, Corey always talks about run and gun and running ridges. But how do you approach a ridge basin or drainage without skylining yourself? Whenever I am on a ridge, I feel exposed and have been busted doing this. Would like some info on how you navigate through the woods and why you do it that way. So when we're talking about run and gun calling elk, which last week in Wyoming is is a perfect example. We were covering 12 or 13 miles a day. And, uh, you know, we're looking for sign along the way, but we're stopping at every point where we feel we can broadcast out a bugle and we're throwing one out there trying to get a response. And so that's, that's what run and gun is. We aren't stopping. We aren't still hunting. We aren't getting into sign and slowing down. We're looking for a bugle. And the easiest way to cover country is on a ridge. And so in Wyoming where we're hunting, we're hunting timbered country where it's heavily timbered. You know, there might be some open ridges, some south exposures that are, that are kind of open. But for the most part, we're in the timber even on a ridge. So we aren't worried about being skylined. Uh, and then second to that, where the elk are bedding, they're in those thick north-facing slopes. They aren't able to see out very well onto those skylines, and they usually aren't watching the skylines during the middle of the day. So we are hitting the ridge systems, usually the main ridges that have some finger ridges and you know little drainages and draws coming off of them. And we're calling down into each of those draws from the main ridge. And we're just tying one ridge into the next and hitting a saddle and going going to the next one. So definitely not as concerned about being exposed visually there. And I think the primary concern for us in doing that is making sure the wind is good so that we aren't walking to an area and calling into it with the wind blowing down into that area. So we're continually paying attention to what the wind's doing and moving to a location that allows us to take advantage of that location based on what the wind's doing. I think if you're hunting some of those more open areas, uh, some of the desert states and things, you have to be a little bit more careful about being on a true ridge And at that point, you are skylined, especially first thing in the morning or in the evening, you know, when the elk are active and and when they're out, if you're on a ridge and you're walking along that ridge bugling, they're going to locate and pinpoint where you are. They're going to look up there and see you skylined there and it's it's not going to work out. So if I am hunting that more open country, I'm making sure I'm stopping where I have cover. There have been a lot of times that we've called from the from an open hillside and an elk responds 100 yards away and we're stuck. We, we have nowhere to go and set up. We're caught out in the open. And so we're more selective about where we do stop and call. So if there is an elk 100 yards away, we have cover to take advantage and set up right there, as well as not getting picked off from 1,000 yards away as an elk looks up on the hill and is trying to uh, visually locate where that sound is coming from. So great question. And uh, obviously terrain is going to dictate how you do things, but you don't want to be skylined. You don't want to be smelled and you want to move as quietly as you can. Yeah. You know, I, I end up that, that question applies a lot of times in rifle hunting for us because by that time in the post rut or late season, 
you're not going to be doing a lot of calling, but you certainly just like in what you talked about, you don't want to be skyline. So we will use ridges because like you said, you can cover so much ground with ridges. Also, if you're up higher, you, you looking down into things is way better for glassing than trying to look up. Same with shooting angles. If you're, if you're talking two, three, 400 yard shots, you're, if you're above the animal, you're going to have way better opportunity for shot angles. So we use ridges a lot, but if there's a bald spine ridge, we're going to be off on the shaded side of that ridge below the skyline moving and know that, all right, there's a little draw, there's a little piece of brush or whatever that we can come back up to the crest of the ridge and glass down in the other side. We're using cover. It might be rocks, might be brush, uh, whatever it is, but we're going to try our best to stay on the shaded side of the ridge. Usually also, if there is any cover on the ridge, it's going to be on that shaded north or east side. And so it, it allows you to cover a lot of terrain in a hurry and do it without looking like a big light bulb up there because if elk see that the gigs up almost as not quite as bad but almost as bad as if they smell yep. you and so it's it just it requires yep totally a, you know two or three minutes of looking at it and saying okay i can do this and this is how i can negotiate this ridge or get over to that next series of canyons the head of those or to this next spine without having to show the whole elk world where i'm at so yep well Corey, thanks a ton uh thanks for everyone who's listening i i look forward to your reports from uh idaho um i uh i think that'll be a lot of fun for you even though you're not the tag holder uh hopefully, hopefully you'll <laughs> well get, we may, uh, may maybe you'll we get, may be able to make it out for a couple more days as well so yeah i was gonna say you, you'll find some days to squeak in there i would hope i i hope so as well <laughs> <laughs> well everybody yeah. thanks for listening i hope you get out and do your elk hunting uh it is the season don't uh don't waste it sitting at home watching TV. Absolutely. Football is not that important. And it'll still be on when elk season's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Until the next time. Take care, Corey. You too. Thanks, Randy.